Today's video was recorded on May 23rd, 2023. Today's lesson is the third in our series that we're calling Bible 101. And so this Bible 101 series, well, it's covering some of the foundational concepts that we find in Scripture. These are concepts that are often taken for granted that we know them. And these are really concepts that we as Christians ought to be able to articulate as the basis of our faith. So the first two topics we're exploring are redemption and covenant. So God has a plan. It's called the plan of redemption. And this is where he's in the process of redeeming humanity and the cosmos from the chaos that we find ourselves in today. That's redemption, bringing the world back into the presence of God. And then the second part of that is that God's plan of redemption is carried out through a series of covenants. So they start with Adam, then Noah, and we have Abraham, Moses, David, and of course, Jesus. And Jesus is our new covenant mediator. That's how we enter into a relationship with God through that new covenant. And it's through the blood of Jesus as the mediator. So this week we'll be exploring the Abrahamic covenant. And we're going to look at the symbolism of a covenant ratification ceremony and what it communicates. And this is really a powerful lesson. Because when you can understand what's happening with the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 15, you can then see why Jesus had to go to the cross for the forgiveness of sins. Now, in order to get to this point, we have to walk through the idea of an ancient covenant ratification ceremony. We have to look at the symbols and what they represent. And once we have those symbols, things start to fall into place. Now, if you haven't already done so, make sure you download the PDFs that we have on our website that cover the topic of covenant. In fact, if you can read through the document that has to do with cutting a covenant before viewing this lesson, it'll significantly enhance your learning experience. And you can find links to those documents there directly below in the show notes. Fig Tree Ministries is a 501c3 nonprofit biblical education ministry. And our mission is to help people go deeper with their study of the Bible by looking at the text through the cultural lens of the ancient Near East and first century Israel. And we see time and again that when people come to appreciate how important understanding the culture is to seeing the message of the Bible, it's like the world of the Bible begins to open up for them right in front of their very eyes. Now, Fig Tree Ministries, we're 100% listener supported. So if you've found our lessons valuable, if they've helped you gain insight into the biblical text, then we ask that you would consider a financial donation to Fig Tree Ministries. Now, financial donations are easy and they're secure through our website, figtreeteaching.com. You can find the donate link. That actually takes you to a third-party organization. It's called DonorBox. And when you make your donation through DonorBox, you'll immediately receive an email confirmation of the transaction. And then you're able to have your own account at DonorBox and you're able to keep track of all of your transactions. This makes it easy when it comes time to file your taxes. So to all of our financial donors, we cannot thank you enough for your generous support that makes this ministry possible. So we hope you enjoy this profound lesson on the Abrahamic covenant, and we pray that by gaining a deeper understanding of covenant and the covenant ratification ceremony, that this lesson will solidify the foundations of your faith. As we continue on, then, we get to the Abrahamic covenant. And I think this is one of the most important covenants because it's the one that all of Paul's argument is about. How do you get inside this Abrahamic covenant? Do you have to be circumcised? Because we'll see that's one of the requirements. More and more in the last 20 years, more and more people, you can find more information about this particular covenant because of the, what God does inside of it. And that's good to see because more people are being are comfortable with uh, what's going on in the Old Testament. More information is, is coming available to people. So that's always nice. Okay, so Bible 101. You know, I always look for a painting. Well, this right here is actually AI generated. Artificial intelligence made this, which is remarkable. It looks like a real photograph. I thought it was a real photograph. But it's not. AI generated, and of course, it's, it's supposed to be depicted 
depiction of Abraham, and we'll see tonight, you know, God says, I'm going to give you kids. Abraham's an Easterner. He wants something concrete. Says, uh, I need a little more than that. God goes, all right, step outside, come out of your tent, look at the stars, see if you can count them. That's how many kids are going to be descending from you. He's like, okay, got it now, and then keeps going on. That's very Eastern, doesn't need an abstract answer. But that's what the depiction is here in the, uh, in the background. But I did think that was kind of cool that it was AI generated. Okay, this is the third one as we're talking about redemption and covenant, the plan of redemption that is set forth through a series of covenants. And we went through that series, Adam to Noah, that's when it really renews, then Noah, Abraham, Moses will do next week. David, we're not going to do one. We'll go right forward from Moses to Jesus. But it's through a series of covenants that God is executing his plan of redemption. So this is going to be the Abrahamic covenant. Now, you can put a marker, or, you know, if you have a little Bible marker or something, you can put it in Genesis 15, because we'll be there eventually. That's where we're going to find the meat and potatoes of this covenant. But let's start. On your handout, I'm just going to do a quick review, raise the awareness of what the definition of covenant in our mind is. We did this last week. I'll just do it again quickly. So the covenant definition is an agreement, right? God's not despotic. He doesn't force you into it. There's two parties, one on either side of, of the agreement. One or both make promises under oath. And that's what we're going to look at tonight, this idea of promises under oath. What's the mechanism for making an oath back then? Okay, we'll talk about that. What's the, the promise? To perform? I'm, I'm going to do something for you, or I'm going to do something, or I'm going to not do something. Certain actions all stipulated in advance. So that's our definition of covenant. And then inside of every covenant, when you're going to create a covenant, you have a Covenant ratification ceremony. This is number two on your sheet. So we've got to affirm this covenant. We've got to go through some. Um, I was trying to think. I guess I, I, I was thinking maybe when you're at a wedding, you say all your vows, you get to the very end, and the covenant ratification ceremony, I suppose, is you may kiss the bride, right? That's the big moment where it's two become one. That's Kissing the bride is better than sacrificing a goat. So let's put it that way. So covenant ratification. Now, just in case, let's talk about what does it mean to ratify? Because, you know, we don't use that word very often. But essentially, ratification is the process of giving your formal consent, saying yes. If the U.S. State Department, let's say, or the president, decided to make an international agreement, we would call it a treaty, but it's the same idea, a treaty or a covenant. The U.S. president or the State Department, the administration, can't force the people of the United States to agree to enter a treaty. They're not allowed to do that. You have to ratify it. You have to go through a process, right? How do you go out to 330 million people and ask them if they agree? Well, you ratify it through the Congress. So the president can't bind the people in an agreement without a process of ratification. And now we do that through representative government. But when you go through a ratification, that then makes it officially valid. And we might say, in, our, in, in more modern terms, you have to sign on the dotted line. When you come to an agreement, when you take out a mortgage, you sign with a Bic pen. Well, in the ancient world, as that's actually still the same way in very traditional societies, not only societies in the Middle East, definitely the Bedouin societies around Israel, Jordan, Iraq, Syria. When you make that, that covenant ratification is a sacrifice, and it has to do with blood. So it's a, instead of a Bic pen, because they don't have a document, it's a blood sacrifice. And then what's very interesting, 
and I've, I, I don't think I put this on your sheet, but we'll see it tonight with circumcision, is when you create a covenant, especially in tr- very traditional societies, how do you know if you're in, inside that covenant? You put a mark on the skin. Anthropologists have found this in Africa. When tribes make covenants, they put a mark in the skin, and all you have to do is show that mark in the skin. It says, I'm inside of this covenant, and you're good. What's the mark of the covenant here with Abraham? It's a mark in the skin, circumcision. So you have to ratify it, and we're going to ratify it by shedding blood. Now, why blood? Well, I think everybody gets this by now, but blood, it represents life. And it's going to come to represent your life. Now, I put two verses on your sheet. Go look at them. We're not going to do that tonight. But go look at them when you get a chance. Leviticus 17, 11. Life is in the blood. And so God is, does not want you to mishandle the blood. Don't eat an animal that wasn't properly sacrificed where the blood can be drained. So the life and the life of a human being is in the blood. And then Hebrews 9, 11 to 15. I put that on your handout as well. But what that blood represents, when you ratify with blood, is you're basically saying, I'm putting my life on the line. The blood that represents life now represents my life. Till death do us part. So the blood is going to come to represent you or whoever's entering that covenant. And we'll see that a couple times tonight. Now, one of the things that um, is common in the Middle East, but then was very common uh, in, with the Israelites, is something, this is number three on your sheet, a blood path ratification ceremony. What's a blood path? Okay, so a blood path, I'll, do, I'll just show you a picture. A picture is worth a thousand words. You sacrifice the animal and you cut the animal in two. So it would look like this. You get a cow or a heifer or a goat or whatever your animal is, and then I'm not sure how they do it, but you cut that animal in two, dividing the animal, and it creates a blood path. And now you're going to walk through the blood path. And that's going to become the symbolism of you signing on the dotted line. So that's what a blood path is. You cut the animals in half. In fact, so common in Israelite society that you would cut the animal in half to create a covenant. This goes to number four, and I'm moving quickly in the beginning. We'll slow down a little bit when we get to Genesis 15. That in Hebrew, in Judaism, there's a Hebraic idiom. Now, the, the Hebrew language is full of idioms. And of course, an idiom is an expression that represents something that's different than the words being used, right? So, to make a covenant, if I'm going to come into a covenant with someone, they call it cutting a covenant, to cut a covenant. Why? Because the process of cutting the animal in half. And I'll show you a, a phrase in the Bible that even that's, you know, we translate it as made a covenant, but it's to cut a covenant. Okay, so just real quick, I'll give you the Hebrew here. So uh, the word karat means to cut. And then in Hebrew, berit is covenant. And you put those two together and you get the expression to cut a covenant. And that simply means to make a covenant, to come into agreement. So, if you have your Bible at Genesis 15, take a look at verse 18. So, Genesis 15, 18. We're just going to do this one, just the beginning. I just want to show you where this phrase, to cut a covenant, comes in. And it actually is in our Abrahamic story. Chapter 15, verse 18 starts out. On that day, God made a covenant with Abram. Hasn't changed his name yet to Abraham. 
I'll just keep saying Abraham all night. But it's this word made. Now that, of course, is trans. It's not only translation, but it's interpretation because we translated the word. It's actually karat, and that means to cut. So if you translated it literally, it would say, "On that day, God cut a covenant with Abraham." And then you have all us, you know, Americans scratching our heads, saying, "What does it mean to cut a covenant?" And now you got to go find out that answer. So our English just makes it easy. God made a covenant. God established a covenant. God, whatever your Bible happens to say. But I just want you to know that phrase, to cut a covenant, shows up right there in Genesis 15, in the middle of a covenant-making ceremony, as we'll see in a minute. Okay, so that's where it is in the Bible. Now, what, what are you doing here? You cut the pieces in half, and then each party takes their sandals off, because you got to walk, you got to get your feet in the blood, and you walk through the pieces. You're going to walk, step in the blood, very dramatic, right? This is, you can't get more dramatic than this to solidify your commitment to the covenant, right? I mean, imagine if you were signing your mortgage documents and the banker brings out a goat. And you agreed that if you failed to make this mortgage payment, you could see the weightiness of this, of what's going on in front of you. And I, I seriously, I often think, you know, if you do this at a wedding, you know, because what are you saying when you walk through the blood? What are you saying? What are you communicating to all the witnesses and the people around you? You're saying this. You're saying, if I sin against this covenant, if I violate this covenant, then you can do this to me. The animal comes to represent me. And you can imagine in those very, in very traditional societies around the world, they still do this for weddings. And you can imagine what happens when the guy isn't what he committed himself to be. And the bride's family does to him what they did to that sacrificial animal. And the whole community accepts it. They understand it. There's a collective agreement that's very powerful in those traditional societies. You do not stray. Again, as you're walking off the altar at your wedding, you know, there's a couple animals that have been cut apart and you got to walk through the blood reciting your vows. That makes your wedding significantly more dramatic. And especially if everybody in the audience who's witnessing is in agreement that if you violate that covenant, that happens to you. It becomes something that's far more, I'm not, again, I'm being facetious about the, the bringing back sacrifices, but I just want to emphasize the weightiness of what's going on with this ceremony, because that's what you're saying. You can do this to me, and I'll give you two examples. So number five on your handout, this is one of the best examples of what happens with these covenants. So number five, this is an Assyrian king, and the beginning part of his name, Ashur Nerari. Now, Ashur, we saw that name last week with an Assyrian king. That's Ashur is their god. So they all take on the, like Ramses is Ra, the god Ra. So this, this king is making a covenant with Mati'ilu of Arpad. And now you can read this whole thing. It's fairly lengthy. And then you get to the part about this sacrifice, the ritual sacrifice to ratify the covenant. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of it. It's basically saying, look, the lamb that we're bringing out, well, it's not a lamb just for a, a, a sacrifice for a deity. It's not a lamb for a meal. Oh, this is a lamb to ratify a covenant, right? And then it says this, this head is not the head of a lamb. It's the head of Mati'ilu. Ah, see? That's what it represents. Not only Mati'ilu, it's the head of his sons, his official, and the whole people of his land. Now, you can imagine, your kids are now going to be caught up in this if dad violates the covenant. How much pressure do you have to not violate the covenant? Okay, then it keeps going. It says, if Mati'ilu 
sins against this treaty, notice the language, so may just as the head of this spring lamb is torn off, the head of Mati'ilu be torn off. And then it goes on, and of his sons and his officials and the people of his land and blah, 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 blah. But you can see the weight of that, what this ceremony does, what it brings into the covenant making, and the gravity of what happens should you violate that covenant. All right, that's one example. Second example, turn in your Bible, because we have, the exa- we have this illustrated in our Bible. So turn to, this is number six on your handout, Jeremiah. We'll look at 18 and 20, but just to give you a little bit of what's happening, the Babylonians are coming against Jerusalem. So it's right before the fall of Jerusalem when Babylon is coming down to Judea. Or I'm sorry, down to Judah, not Judea yet, Judah. And so there's an issue where, you know, in the Bible, a Hebrew person can be a slave to another Hebrew. After seven years, you have to let them go. And so there's a, through the prophet Jeremiah, God says, look, you need to let these people go. They shouldn't be your slaves any longer because there's an enemy coming, right? We need all the people we can get. So some of the people, the leaders, went in front of the temple and made a covenant. They cut a covenant. And then some of them reneged on their promise and went back and took their, or kept their slave or took back their slave, whatever it was. So now here's God speaking through Jeremiah, verse 18. So God says, I will give the men who transgressed my covenant, right? So notice. They violated the covenant agreement that they made, who have not performed the words of the covenant which they made before me. And now here's the key when they cut the calf in two and passed between its parts. So, right there, you see the illustration of cutting a covenant in Jeremiah. Now, what happens, right? What does that calf represent when you cut, when you walk through the pieces? That's you, that's your life. So verse 19, the officials of Judah and the officials of Jerusalem and the eunuchs and the priests and all the people of the land who passed between the parts and of the calf, I will give them into the hands of their enemy. And then it goes on to say, into the hands of those who seek their lives, their dead bodies shall be food for the birds of the sky and the animals. Tragic way of dying, right? But you understand, hey, once I make that commitment, That's what I accept is going to happen to me as the penalty for violating the covenant. So good illustration to remember the idea of cutting a covenant is and the idea of creating that blood path. Again, still done today in very, in the tribal, very rural places of the Middle East and Africa. Um, Okay, last piece before we get to the Abraham one. Just a reminder. If somebody's watching this for the very first time on video, you'll have to go back and see some of our other uh, videos on Exodus when we talk about the presence of God. God's presence always shows up two ways in the Old Testament. Do you remember what they are? They're probably on your sheet, so it won't take long to look down on your sheet. They're fire, right? God shows up in fire, the burning bush, the pillar of fire. There's fire came down on Mount Sinai. It's the fire at Pentecost is the presence of God. So God shows up as fire. He also shows up as smoke. Now, this picture that I put on there is supposed to be a smoking fire pot. So a fire pot that creates smoke. It looks like more flame than smoke, but it's really supposed to be a smoking fire pot. So God is the pillar of smoke. He's the smoke or the cloud on Mount Sinai. He's the cloud that comes down into the tabernacle. That's how the presence of God is always depicted in the Bible. And we're going to see that show up in the Genesis uh, 15 covenant. Okay, now with that, if you turn your handout over, one thing, we can't go too deep, we can't go too deep into this, but I just want to let you know, There is confusion, 
about the whole Abrahamic covenant. And the reason is, is that when we see the promises that God is making, and then the oaths and the obligations, or I'm sorry, the, the stipulations and obligations, they're spread out. They're spread out between Genesis 12 and Genesis 18. And there's two schools of thought, and it's an ongoing debate, whether Genesis 12 to 18 constitutes one covenant spread across all of those chapters throughout the narrative, or are there multiple covenants? I just want you to be aware, and anybody watching this later on the video, I want you to be aware that that debate exists because you can find scholars who will say one or the other. And if you happen to have a commentary on Genesis and it happens to be written by someone who believes there, that there are multiple different covenants, then it's going to disagree with what I'm about to show you. But I happen to agree with the scholars that see Genesis 12 to 18, this whole account, as one covenant. And that the promises, the stipulations, the obligations, that they're spread out. And it's uh, one of the problems we have is that in, the, in our Western mind, we think linear. We think it should go in perfect order. If it's not structured exactly like an ancient Near East covenant being written out, then it's not a covenant. But the Old Testament is an ancient document. It weaves around, sometimes it circles around the way that they put this thing together. And if you look at all the covenants throughout the Old Testament, like the Noah covenant, the sacrifice comes prior to God announcing the covenant. And people still call that as a sacrifice for the covenant. The Mosaic covenant is spread out between Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. You, you don't get the blessings and curses until Deuteronomy. We'll talk about that next week. But we still recognize it as a full covenant. So as I talk through these promises and the stipulations and obligations, you just want to know that there's a debate going on and that the way I'm showing it here, because this is what I firmly believe, is that it's one covenant. Okay? So if you look at, I made a list, and what you can see is that God is making promises and they're spread out through chapter 12, 15, 17, 18. We're not going to turn and read them all, but I just want you to know where they're at. I put them on your sheet. And they keep repeating themselves. It's reiterating the same idea. People, land, blessing. People, land, blessing. There's a couple times in there where it's going to say something about Abraham's responsibility. Okay? But let's start with God. What is God promising Abraham? Starting from chapter 12 all the way out to chapter 18. One, God says, look, you're going to be a great nation. That, that's right off the bat. When when God pulls Abraham out of uh, Haran with his family, then he says right off the bat, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to make you a great name. And oh, by the way, I'm going to bless all the people of the world through you, meaning there's going to be a seed one day that's going to bless the whole world. Now, of course, that's the Messiah. And that's what Paul's going to pick up on. These are all coming out of, it's both uh, Genesis 12 and Genesis 18. God's going to say, hey, look, I'm going to protect you. We'll read that. We'll see that tonight in Genesis 15. I'm going to give you many descendants. I'm going to give you a land grant, just like we saw last week. That's repeated three times. So I'm going to give you land. And then I'm going to make you a father of many nations. So all of these throughout the document are promises that God's making, but we only see one ratification ceremony. And that's what we'll look at in Genesis 15. So you kind of have to bundle all of these together and then go to Genesis 15, and that's the ratific ratifying of the covenant. So, okay, so that's what God's going to do. And that's really no problem for God. We know that. But what does Abraham have to do? What are his obligations. Okay, he's got three that God's going to give him. Pretty easy here. Walk before me and be blameless. Abraham, just don't sin. And all will go well with you, right? 
So Genesis 17, uh, 17, 1, you can read it later. Walk before me and be blameless. He goes on, God goes on to say, every male has to be circumcised. Now, right there, can you imagine the agitation within certain of the certain people within the uh, the Jewish people during Jesus day when they're saying no you you can enter the covenant without circumcision and they're pointing they're jumping up and down pointing to their bible saying but it's right there in the text and we might be joining them you know many of us would be joining saying uh 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 don't water this covenant down right so every male must be circumcised okay and then the last one Basically, God says, look, you need to teach your descendants to keep the way of the Lord. Basically saying, you need to teach your descendants to obey God, to obey my commandments. That's Genesis 18, 19. Again, you can go back and read those, but that's what Abraham has to do. Not sin, have all your people circumcised, and teach your descendants to obey God. So, easy stuff, right? So now we get to the actual covenant ratification ceremony. So now you can turn to Genesis 15. And I'm not going to read it verse by verse. If you have your eyes on your Bible, you'll be able to follow along. So God, of course, shows up to Moses. He's out in the desert. He says, hey, Moses, I'm going to be your shield, which means I'm going to protect you. I'm going to be your great reward. That's right about verses 1 and 2 of chapter 15. And Abraham immediately responds. He doesn't say, hey, thank you, God, for that. He says, but wait a minute. I don't have any kids. How am I going to, how am I going to, what am I going to do with this blessing if I can't pass it on to my children? Abraham says, look, I got a servant who's a Gentile. How can I pass this on, right? So. As soon as he says that, that's when God says, okay, okay, Abraham, no problem. Step outside, look at the stars. And that's what this painting in the background is depicting. Look up at the stars. Count them if you can, Abraham. Almost like sarcastic. That's how many kids you're going to have. Abraham says, got it. Okay? Then God's going to say, I'm going to give you land. And at this one, Abraham, again, challenges God, says, oh yeah, but how can I know for sure? And now we're going to enter into this covenant agreement here. So if you look down at verse 8, 15 verse 8, this is where Abraham is going to challenge God, right? He says, but Lord, how am I to know that I'm going to possess it. How am I going to know for sure? And then it's at this point, and this is critical for us to understand, God, starting in verse 9, God's simply going to say, okay, go get me a heifer, a goat, a ram, a turtle dove, and a pigeon. And we all scratch our heads. What is going on here? Why is he telling them to go get these animals? That doesn't make any sense, right? And, and it's at this point that God just says, and, and what's sometimes you have to look at what is not written in the Bible. So at this point, God doesn't give him any instructions. Abraham knows how to cut a covenant. He knows a blood path ceremony. So he just goes and he gets the animals and he cuts them in two, right? So here we have, let me get, put the depiction back up here. So he says, get me a heifer, get me a goat, a female goat, Get me a ram, and then I want a turtle dove and a pigeon. And then he's going to cut them in two, right? So he cuts them in half. Now, I have no idea. How, did Ab how does Abraham, how do you cut a heifer in half? For those of you that grew up dealing with heifers, this is not an easy task. And is Abraham alone? Does he have the household with him? Is his servant there? You know. What kind of tools? None of this is explained. It just says he cut the animals in half. Now you get the blood path. This is what he's doing. He knows exactly what he's doing. He cuts the animals in half, and that creates 
the blood path. And now you're going to walk through the blood. You're going to recite the vows as you're walking through the blood. But what's so critical is what happens next. So if you look down, and we'll deal with this in a minute, verse 12, it says that Ab- as the sun was going down, Abraham falls into a deep sleep. And then verse 12 says something to the effect of there was a thick and dreadful darkness that came upon him. God's going to talk to him about the future. We'll, we'll, I'll, I'll deal with that in a second. But then look at verse 17. So verse 17 in the Bible says, Then a smoking fire pot, that's smoke, and then a flaming torch. And what do they do? They pass between the pieces. Where's Abraham? He's asleep. So who walks through the blood? Both of those are representations of God, the fire and the smoke. And what we see here is God walking through the blood on Abraham's behalf. God picks up his side of the covenant as well, because that blood path represents your life, right? That's what you can do to me if if I sin against this covenant. And God says, I'll take your side, Abraham. I'll take the penalty. If you sin, Abraham, I'll pay the penalty. Now think about that. This is brilliant, right? So, for all of the descendants of Abraham, if they sinned, God was going to take the penalty. How does God pay for the penalty for all of that sin? Jesus. And it's at this moment that God, this is the theological conundrum that people can't understand. Why did Jesus have to die? Because God promised that he'd pay for the, the, the price for the sin. It's in the covenant. Somebody has to pay the price, and Abraham never walks through the blood. It's absolutely brilliant. And so basically, and I'm just putting this, this is my quote up here. What God is saying is, Abraham, if you or any of your descendants, because the covenant is forever, if you sin against this covenant, I'll pay the penalty on your behalf. And that is, obviously, it's so huge in my mind. Because people struggle with, how does Jesus fulfill this promise to pay for sins? Well, God has to shed his blood. Just like the animals on the cross, or just like the animals back at, uh, at that covenant making. So I, I think when people see this, it's like, ah, now I get the theological reason behind Jesus' death and how that you come out of that with forgiveness of sins. And then why Paul is so adamant that you can, that you can get into that Abrahamic covenant because that's where the blessings are. And of course, you know, you get all the debates about it. But anyways, I hope you can see that. But you got to know that covenant ceremony. You got to know ratification. You got to know what the pieces are that are moving through, uh, or I'm sorry, what are the objects, the, the, the torch and the smoking fire pot moving through down the blood path and what it communicates. So, okay, hopefully you can see that. Now that's, that's really the main stuff, but hold on, it gets better. So check this out. I want to show you two things. And these are like a little bit of an afterthought, but it's so cool. Okay, look at number 10 on your handout. I, I talked about darkness came over and Abraham goes into this a deep sleep in a thick and dreadful darkness. And what happens at that moment is God begins to tell Abraham about the future. Okay, we're going to read it in a minute, but he's, it's all about the future. He's showing him a picture of the future. Okay, so look, if you look at uh, Genesis 15, verses 12 to 14. So it says, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell over Abraham. And then this version says, and look, a terror of great darkness fell upon him. 
This is because God's showing up and he's about to show you a vision of the future. And God says to Abraham, know for certain that your descendants will live as foreigners in a land that's not theirs, and they'll be servants there, and they will oppress them for 400 years. But I will also judge that nation whom they will serve, and afterwards they'll come out with many possessions. Now, right there, we know what he's talking about. He's talking about the upcoming exodus that, we're gonna, that we know about coming out of Egypt. But there was a debate, okay? Now, you guys don't know about this debate yet, but it's found in rabbinic writings. And the rabbis are debating, how far into the future did God show Abraham? And that might sound like a strange deb debate to us, but it's based on the, the Hebrew that's, that's being used. So how far, how far out did God show Abraham? Some rabbis said, well, he only showed him to the date that they left ex uh, Egypt. The date that they, that, that would be Passover, by the way, but the date that they left Egypt. Other rabbis said, oh no, he showed him that day. And that day is when the final redemption's happening, the Messiah. So two debates, how far out? And now we can go to Jesus and say, Jesus, how far out did God show Abraham in this vision? And Jesus tells us, okay? So turn if you would, to John, John 8, verse 56. And people always have questions about what does this mean, what, that, what Jesus is saying? So Jesus is uh, talking to the religious leaders. And Jesus says to the religious leaders, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And then it says, he saw it and was glad. Now, that might seem like a totally far out statement because people are like, how did Abraham see the day of the Messiah, Jesus' time? So first of all, Jesus telling you he's the Messiah, the final redemption is beginning, but also he's inside that rabbinic debate. How far out did Abraham see? He saw all the way to my day, Jesus says, and he was glad to see the Messiah and what was happening. Again, I just want to show you that because this is so deep. It's so deeply connected. Jesus is engaging his people on their terms. It's us. We have to do the work to decipher it, okay? But that's one debate. Now, last one, and we'll finish with this. It has to do with the words on that day, okay? Genesis 15, 18, if you're back in Genesis 15, sorry to make you bounce around here. Genesis 15, 18 says this, on that day, God made a covenant with Abraham. Well, what is that day? And now what the rabbis do, and Jesus does this, and so do the, the, the disciples, they're scanning their mind for these Hebrew phrases, and they start making connections, okay? And they interpret based off of those connections. So what day is he talking about? And they said, ah, he's talking about the day that they left Egypt. Because, if you turn in your Bible again, sorry, Exodus 12, verse 41. If not, I'll put it on the screen. But Exodus 12, verse 41. Exodus 12 is the Passover. It's the time that they're leaving Egypt. And what we find in Exodus 12 is the same conversation. It's reflecting back about the time that the children of Israel were in Egypt. And then it says this, now the time of the dwelling of the children of Israel who were in Egypt was 430 years. And it happened, now get this, it happened at the end of 430 years even the same day it happened, now we're, we'll get back to that, that all of the people left Egypt. What does it mean, even the same day? And the rabbis put those two together, said that those phrases connect. Okay, and here's, and you think, well, big deal. What day, what's the holiday that the Israelites leave Egypt? It's the Passover. They leave on the Passover. 
And if it's to the very day that Abraham made his covenant with God, then Abraham's covenant was made on a Passover day. Okay? That's what the rabbis see in this. So check this out. You get this phrase, on that day, this is my little timeline I'm, I'm making. I, try, I wanted to use red just so it looked like a blood path. On that very day, it says in Exodus 12, that's, pa that's Passover. They left Egypt and it was on Passover. Now, if you go backwards in time, what day are they starting at? Well, it's, Ge it's um, Genesis 15, what we just read. On that, on that day, God made a covenant with Abraham. And so the rabbis say, ah, that must have been a Passover. It doesn't tell us in the text, but we can infer that by the language that's used in the conversation that's happening. And now think about the significance of this. If this is true, tell me something else that has to do with both the Abrahamic covenant and the Exodus that also took place on a Passover. Go to a Passover out into the future, and there you find Jesus. And it's his death, it's his blood that not only looks to the past that pay for the sins, just like the Abrahamic covenant says, God's going to pay for the sins. And Jesus does that through his blood, but it also looks to the future. It's a new covenant being created in the blood of Jesus. He's the sacrificial, he's the ratification ceremony for the new covenant going forward. Now, I don't know about you, but this blows my mind because you think, how significant could it be? This is just like God. He would put those things right on exactly the same day. On a Passover, Abraham makes this covenant. On a Passover, Jesus dies for the sins of the world. And, oh, by the way, Passover is the beginning of the story of redemption, right? When God is delivering you out of the slavery of your circumstances to be with him, and then you eventually we're going to dwell intimately. And of course, the, the cross and the sacrifice of Jesus is the turning point of all of that in history. So anyways, just a thought. Now you have to go to rabbinic writings to get that, but boy, you can see the picture that's, that God has going on and how coordinated God is. So, okay. Okay, just a quick review. It's all about that ratification ceremony. We do ratific ratification ceremonies. We do it by signing things. They did it with blood. You create a blood path. That's what's happening in the uh, Genesis 15. It's called in Hebrew to cut a covenant. That's what it means to make a covenant. So Genesis 15 becomes the center point. All those promises that, God are, God, that God's making Abraham, the ratification ceremony is there in Genesis 15, and God walks for Abraham so critical that we understand the significance of that. His promise that Israel, I'm not going to give you up forever. You might suffer for your sin, but I won't give you up forever. Second, that last little bit that we see in John, Abraham sees the Messiah during the, his look to the future, and Jesus confirms that. That's kind of cool. And then, of course, if it's all, ta all these events are taking place on a Passover, and Jesus becomes our Passover lamb and the covenant ratification moving forward. Just blows my mind. Okay, so that's the Abrahamic covenant. So much in there that uh, you'll probably have to let it soak in a little bit. It's always good to review it. You can't do this stuff enough, and it just keeps seeping in, and it solidifies. But it really does magnify what Jesus did and how important it is in the whole redemptive history.